I want to talk to you today about the guidance of the Holy Spirit, because one of the things that he offers us is his guidance and his leadership, and we should be so much seeking that and desiring to know what God wants us to do, because anytime we do what we want to do, if it's not what God wants us to do, it is not going to work out. How many of you have already had that sad experience of trying to run your own life and found out that it really is that you're really just not so good at it as you thought that you might be? So I want to start in John 16, 7, although I was there last night, I'm probably going to be reading this pretty much every session because it reminds us of what the Holy Spirit wants to do for us. Father, we thank you for the word today and approach the subject with reverence. I ask you to bring truth out. However, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. This is Jesus speaking. When I say that it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. How could anything be better than Jesus? Because if I don't go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, and the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons why it was better to have the Holy Spirit than Jesus was because, first of all, he is the Spirit of Christ. So it's not like we, we lost Jesus, but the Holy Spirit has a different dynamic. Jesus came as son of God, son of man, he was in a body just like I'm in up here. So he could only be one place at one time dealing with one person at a time. The Holy Spirit, however, can be everywhere all the time working in every person's life, bringing them into spiritual maturity. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is he works in our life after we're born again to bring us and conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. How many of you are aware that the moment that you're born again, God is not finished and you're not all mature and grown up, that you still have, a, I mean, it's pretty much a lifetime journey, wouldn't you say so? And so I want you just to think about it. Even the message that I speak today, it's possible that God, that the Holy Spirit can take what I say and he could minister a hundred different things out of it to different people, depending on what you need. Some people will hear things that I say that others of you won't even hear at all. So the Holy Spirit is amazing in how he works in such an individual way in our life. That's why it's so important to develop a close, intimate, fellowshipping relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, the word comforter cannot be explained in English. The original language the word that comforter comes from, you can't, you can't explain it in English with one word. And so the Amplified Bible here has amplified the, the Greek, and it says the comforter is the counselor, the helper, advocate, that means he pleads our case for us, intercessor, he strengthens us, and in case we don't need any of that, he stands by just to see what we might need. So he can jump on board and help us. And people have been getting pretty excited about that. That's kind of interesting to think that somebody's standing by all the time just in case you need him for anything. Um, so he says, if I go away, then I will send him to be in close fellowship with you. Now, if we go on and we read verse 8, and when he comes... He will convict and convince the world about sin and about righteousness. Now, here's a good little lesson that will help you in your everyday life and in your homes and in your businesses and your churches. The Holy Spirit is the one and the only one who has the job and is successful at convicting people of sin. It's not your job. It's not my job. Took me years to learn it was not my job to convince Dave of all the changes that he needed to make in his life. 
Now, obviously, we train our children. I'm not saying that there's no correction, but I am saying that how many of you know that we, we waste a lot of our time trying to do God's job? And it just doesn't work out. And so it's very refreshing, even as, even as much as I know this stuff and I've taught it, just reading that and preparing for these messages on the Holy Spirit, I got another whole fresh revelation of, thank God I don't need to spin my wheels trying to change people. Some of you might be thinking, well, if I don't stay busy doing that, what will I do with myself? Well, see, the point is, is you cannot change anybody else, but you can pray humbly that if they truly need changing, and it's not just your imagination, that God himself will do the work and you can plead with God that while he's working in those people you've prayed for, that he will also make big changes in you. Well, I like that more than you do, but anyway. He's the convictor and the convincer. You know, Dave doesn't even know this, so I'm telling on myself, but the other, you know, I used to, man, I would try to get Dave to do what I wanted him to do. And I can't say I never do it, but man, I've learned a secret. The other day, it was just something simple. I asked him if he could go down, he was getting ready to go play golf. And you know, when Dave's ready to go play golf and he's got his equipment and he's ready to rock and roll, it's not a great time to ask him to do something. And uh, so I said to him, uh, he was in the bathroom, he had the golf hat on, got the shirt on, he's ready to go. I said, could you go downstairs and get thus and so for me? He's like, no, I don't have time to do that. I got a tea time. Got to get out of here. Now, normally, like a few years ago, or maybe even before I read this, I would have said, You've got time. You get there so early every time you go, and you play golf all the time, and surely you can go downstairs and do this one thing for me. Now, how many of you ladies might have handled it the way I just said that I would have handled it? But I've learned if it's something God wants him to do, I just said, okay, and just was real quiet. I mean, it only took about 30 seconds. He said, well, I guess I can probably make time. And he went downstairs and did it. <laughs> Come on, ladies. Let's turn to wise up. Now, in order to help you, I've exposed my secret. And so the next time I do that, he's going to say, now, you're just being quiet. So I'll go do what you want me to. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, right. He said, he, he said that he was just waiting for me to have a right attitude. Then he knew he would go do it. That is so bad. Okay, now, verse 9, about sin, because they don't believe in me, trust in, rely on, adhere to me. About righteousness, uprightness of heart, right standing with God, because I go to the Father. These are things the Holy Spirit is going to reveal. About judgment. Because the ruler, the evil genius, the prince of the world, Satan, is judged and condemned, and sentence is already passed on him. Now, I still have many things to say to you. I love this one. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them or to take them upon you or to grasp them. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. Everybody say guide. guide. Now, guide is a very nice word. He doesn't shove us into the truth. He doesn't dump all the truth on us at one time that we need in our lives. When I, when I think about this, if I could just put it on a practical level, maybe it was like Jesus saying to the disciples, if I told you guys everything that was wrong with you right now, because, you know, we can read the Bible and see that they weren't exactly excellent choices for apostles. I mean, really, the only one that the world would have picked was Judas. And they would have only picked him because he was educated and had all the stuff that the world thinks you need to serve God. However, he purposely chose people that were unqualified to show that he qualifies us and if our hearts are right toward him, he can and wants to use anybody. 
but they had a lot of stuff still wrong with them. And it was time for Jesus to go. <clears throat> and he's saying, you're going to need more help. There's a lot of things you still need to know and a lot of things you still need to learn. You know, I mean, right now in my life, after studying the word for 40 years and really working with God, I mean, I, I think I'm okay. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not standing here today aware of, you know, 10 things that I need to change in my life. But I know that by this time next month, God will have shown me something. The Holy Spirit will show me something the month after that and the week after that. And see, the thing that I just so love about our walk with the Holy Spirit is he knows what to show you when. He never does it in a condemning way. The devil condemns, but the Holy Spirit convicts. And conviction always makes us aware of what is wrong or what is right. But if it's something wrong, he, he then gives us the power to see that thing lifted out of our life and changed. When I was, when I first started walking with God and I married Dave, oh my gosh, I had so many problems. It was unbelievable. And the thing that was funny was really at that time, I didn't know I had any problems. I mean, I honestly didn't. I thought everybody had a problem. I thought everybody else just needed to do what I told them to do and what I wanted them to do. And then everything was just going to be right. Come on. Some of you are still out there. Don't be laughing at me. Yeah, you're in the right place at the right time today. And don't be thinking about who you wish would have come. You're here. Yeah, because a bunch of you already thought, oh man, so-and-so needed this. And I'm telling you the truth, there were things that maybe God didn't deal with me about for years. Just didn't deal with me about them at all. I was just dumb, didn't have any idea that what I was doing was wrong. But at the right time, when I had come far enough along in my walk with God that now I could endure maybe like a, a deeper dealing from God, then he would show me something else. So I just want to recommend that you turn the case of your recovery <laughs> over to God. The Holy Spirit is the counselor, and I'm not saying you can't go to somebody for counseling, but I do think it's wise to go to somebody who has the counselor living in them. Because I don't think it's really good to get a lot of advice from people who don't even know what they're doing. I had one psychiatrist tell me, she said, before I came to Christ, she said, I was trying to give people advice all the time and tell them what to do with their problems. And she said, one day I got so confused. I thought, you know what? I don't have, even have a clue what I'm talking about. She said, I had more problems than anybody. She said, now I still counsel, but I've been saved and I've read a lot of your books. So I just prescribe your books and just let people go home. <laughs> because the word of God is what's going to change our lives. Amen. 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 All right. So. He will guide you into all truth. Now, truth is very important to God. And I just have a little funny Dave story that will fit in really good right here. Uh, it's amazing where I can put stuff, but I find a way to work it all into the word. So Dave, you know, I was going to be gone on my birthday. Yes, it was my birthday. And I was here preaching to you guys. And so I got some flowers last week. I got a couple of two, three sets of flowers. And so, uh, Dave said, you got some flowers out in the kitchen. So I went out in the kitchen and here's this. I mean, this vase was like this tall and the roses were like, up to, I mean, they were the most beautiful long stem white roses I have ever seen. And so I, I thought I knew who they were from. And so I said, oh, those are really nice. And Dave said, well, aren't you going to look at the card? So I looked at the card and it was from him and said, I went all out for you, babe. And so while I'm making on over him and like, oh, Dave, that was so sweet. And that was so thoughtful. He got this silly grin on his face. Well, it turned out they were from a local pastor in town. <laughs> and he took that guy's card off. <laughs> wrote his own card. And got that pastor's thunder. But he, so 
Dave's still learning a little bit about this being guided into, into truth thing. Anyway, that's an aside, really has nothing to do with all this, but I had to find a place to put it, so there it went. Verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth, for he will not speak his own message on his, on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come, the things that will happen in the future. And then he goes on and says some really things, good things about everything. Verse 15, everything the Father has is mine. That's what I meant when I said that the Spirit will take what is mine and will reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit it unto you. So really, for all intent and purposes, you're here today. I'm a teacher, but you have the teacher living in you. And if you don't, we can take care of that today. And so he is, God is transmitting things to you. It's almost like you're here just getting a holy transfusion of revelation from God and the presence of God. And boy, are you going to be so much stronger and better when you leave. You ever feel like that after you're in a really great church service, kind of like you just had a holy transfusion? Now, I want to talk to you about God as our guide. There's some pretty amazing scriptures. Let, let's look at Psalm 48, 14, for example. For this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide even until death. Well, I like that. I can trust God to guide me. And one of my motives today is I want you to stop thinking that God will guide you and believe that he is guiding you. We've always got everything with God in the future. Well, someday and maybe. And, but God is, faith is now. So right now, I believe that God is leading me and guiding me. And many ways when God is guiding us, initially we can think that we're not getting what we want. Or we can think that what's happening is a disappointment. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, Pastor Mike and his wife travel with us. We're good friends. We've known them for a lot of years. And she's my administrative assistant. He's our staff pastor. And the time came a few years ago when they really wanted to sell their house. They really felt like they were supposed to sell their house. And they, um, um, they put their house up for sale. They knew where they wanted to move. They were really looking forward to it. But the house never sold. Well, you know, no matter how much you want to move, if your house don't sell, you're kind of there. And so Penny and I were talking this morning, and she said, it's a good thing that, we, that God didn't give us what we wanted because that area of town where they wanted to move has since then had a lot of extreme violence in it. And so it would ended up not being a good place for them to be. Let me tell you something. We live life forward, but we understand it backwards. And many times when we're not getting what we want, we don't understand, we're confused. We think God didn't hear us or, or you know, we're not liking what's going on. But I believe that we cannot trust that God will guide us, but that he is guiding us, even because he is our guide. So therefore, if we ask him, guide us, and you have not because you ask not. So please ask, God, I ask you to guide me in everything that I do. What does Proverbs 3 say? Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. And so it's very simple every day to just say, God, this is my plan. But I know that my mind plans my way, but you direct my steps. And so if my plan's not working out, don't let me get all bent out of shape about it. Just know that you have a better plan than I have. Amen. Would it be insulting to you if I told you you're not smart enough to run your own life? Okay. You're not smart enough to run your own life. I mean, that's just the facts. Now, here's another great example from my own life. For at least probably 25 years, I had back trouble. And in having that back trouble, I was constantly going to the chiropractor to get adjustments. I had an MRI on my back. I did have some degenerated discs, but nothing that they felt 
needed surgery. Uh, my back got so bad at one time that I practically begged a surgeon to operate on me. And he said, I can't do it because it's, there's nothing there to operate on. He said, it's, you know, your muscles are all tight and tense. And so I, uh, I wanted to walk for exercise because I really enjoy walking, but I got to the point where I couldn't do that. My back would hurt. And then I finally got to the point where if I tried to do it, I could only walk for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then my hip would just like lock up on me in my groin area. And so I'm getting adjusted and getting adjusted and getting adjusted. And I started working out about 10 years ago and that really helped me, but I still had an ongoing problem. So the, the chiropractor that I went to for many years that had really helped me got really busy in some other areas of his practice that God opened up for him. And because of my schedule and his, I was having a difficult time getting in. And so I felt like I was probably going to need to see somebody else. And I was disappointed because you know what? Sometimes if we're not getting what we're used to, we don't understand what's happening. We look at it as a loss. So one of our sons was going to somebody and he said, why don't you try him? So I went to him and after two visits, he said, well, we, we need to get an MRI and find out what's wrong with your hip. And I thought, yeah, that would probably be good. So after they got the MRI and, and he read it, he said, I'm going to send you to a surgeon and let him take a look at this. So here's a long story short. My hip joint was malformed. It was oblong instead of round. So it was never, ever going to fit into the hip joint right. So no matter what I did, I was always throwing my back out. Well, nobody was looking at the hip because we all thought it was my back. And so God guided that, I believe. He, he, he shut this door. Come on now. He shut this door and I didn't understand. I was disappointed because he shut that door because now I had to walk through a new door that I wasn't even familiar with. I wasn't crazy at that, but that turned out to be a blessing. So lo and behold, the guy that he sent me to had seen me a little bit on television. I don't you know, don't know exactly what his convictions were, but he said, well, you're really going to need a total hip replacement if you want to do this thing right. So, you know, I got this big schedule and I don't have time to get operated on. And so he said, I'm scheduling about three months out. And I said, well, I'll have to wait until next year because the only real span of time that I have off is like from after Thanksgiving until usually around the first of February, we don't schedule a lot of conferences. And so I said, he said, well, we don't want to wait a year. He said, when could you do it? And I said, next week. <laughs> Honestly, this was Wednesday. He said, when could you do it? I said, Monday. <laughs> and he said, all right, I'm going to fit you into my schedule. So we did the surgery and it was six months last month. And in the month of May, the last 21 days of May, I walked 70 miles. And I thought, I was disappointed. Come on, I'm trying to say something. I was disappointed when God started guiding me. in a direction that I didn't want to go in because it wasn't the direction that I was accustomed to. Everything works for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen. Welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life. I'm so glad that you're with us today. We've put together some questions and answers about the guidance and leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a lot to learn about the person of the Holy Spirit. And Ginger's here with me to help us with that discussion. Thank you, Joyce. So I've put together the questions, but you're responsible for the answers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but we have some great questions about the Holy Good. Spirit. And now, did these come from our viewers? Are they did. Good. And we get so many wonderful questions from social media. So yeah. mainly from Facebook and, and um, 
a, a lot of great connections with people there who, as they're going through their lives, they know the importance of the Holy Spirit, but a lot of practical questions on what does it all mean. And some people don't even really know the importance of the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, I, I was in church for a lot of years, and I wasn't really aware of the daily ministry of the Holy Spirit yeah. in my life, and we need to know that. So let's start very foundational. Here's a good question. Pam wants to know, I know who God is. I know who Jesus is, but who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is also God. We would refer to him as the third person of the Trinity, not necessarily delegating him to last place, but God is one God manifested in three persons, which we call the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And so when Jesus completed the work that he was sent here to do, and he went back, to heaven, to sit at the right hand of God, to wait until we all come to be with him. Mm -hmm. He sent the Holy Spirit to represent him, to take his place. And the great thing about the ministry of the Holy Spirit is Jesus could only be one place at one time because although he was fully God, he also came as man, right. son of God, son of man. So he could only be in one place at one time. He could only talk to you or to me. He couldn't be in both places, but the Holy Spirit can be everywhere, all the time, ministering to every person, no matter where they're at. Wow. So, to understand how all that works, because once you have those three things in place, mm -hmm. it's still in the natural, not what we're used to. It's right. out of the ordinary. So, the question next from Otis is, what is the purpose then of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Oh my gosh, that is so good. Well, first of all, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is our strengthener. Uh, he's the one who teaches us and shows us how to pray. He knows the will of God. Uh, he's our teacher. He's our counselor. And all these things are found in the book of John, in John chapter 14 and John chapter 15 and probably in 16. And it talks about exactly what the Holy Spirit does. And so when you, when you think about it, first of all, the Holy Spirit is with us all the time, all the time. And, but he's there to teach us. He's there to guide us. He's there to lead us. He, he wants to show us what the heart of God is. And I love the part in the Amplified Bible that says that he is the standby. And I love that because he's kind of like he's just standing by waiting for us to need him. He's our helper. So he's very valuable. I mean, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life is extremely valuable. Like I, so many people say they don't understand the word. Well, when you start to study the Bible, just simply say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me. Yeah. And that's one of his roles is to help give us understanding, to right. give us insight. That's exactly right. right. Maria wants to know, which scriptures can I read and how do I pray to receive the Holy Spirit into my life? Well, first of all, if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. It's, they're all one. So when you receive Christ, he comes into your spirit to live, dwell, and remain there. And amazingly, the Bible says that we become the home of God. He's our home, and we're his home. And so you have the Holy Spirit. But the way that I like to, to say it is, even though you have something, I have some water in this glass, but the glass is not completely full. And so we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Bible teaches us that we should be ever filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I love to just daily ask God, fill me today with your Holy Spirit. And so, you know, there's a, the Bible talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is to be completely filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is in our spirit, but on the day of Pentecost, when the believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit, the, the Amplified Bible says that they were diffused throughout their souls with the Holy Spirit. So he wants to get into our emotions and our mind and, and every aspect of our lives. So I think a good place for people to start is just to say, fill me with your spirit. I don't want to have just a, a little bit of you. I want all of you that I can have in my life. I want you to fill my thoughts. I want you to, to fill my uh, my words, I want you to use every part of me right. as a 
a servant for God. Yeah, that goes really well with Jane's question because Jane wants to know, do we need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us every day? Now, you just said that that you do that, but it's not because he'll leave us otherwise. No, no, and it's not. It, nothing should ever become like a legalistic formula of feeling like I have to do this every day. That's one of the greatest mistakes that we make as believers, I, I believe that even in that, we're to be led by the Spirit, you know? And so uh, I just say, do it as often as you, as you want to, yeah. you know? I mean, I heard- It's like seeking uh, more of God every yeah, day. Yeah, one- uh, want all of you. One man that's a great pastor has been pastoring for 50 years. He recently shared with our team of leaders that three times a day, he actually takes a moment, gets by himself, and ask the Holy Spirit to fill him, to lead him, and to guide him. So I just think follow your heart, and remember you don't have, there's not a set pattern, but you can't ask him too often, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna go wrong. Good. Monica wants to know, how do you know when the Holy Spirit wants you to do something? So basically, how do you hear the voice? Well, still small voice, or what I would call uh, a knowing, an, an inside knowing, mm -hmm. I think, is the primary way that God speaks to us other than through his word. And that, you know, the word of God is always God speaking to us. Yeah. But uh, I think the way that I like to share this with people is that I believe the Holy Spirit guides us mainly by peace and wisdom. The Holy Spirit's never going to lead us to do anything that is outside the word of God. We should always follow peace says that all, let peace be the umpire in your heart. And, and so we have to realize, let's just say that, you know, I, I really want to buy a new car. Oh, and I get all excited about this new car. Well, you know, it's easy for me to think that I have peace <laughs> about buying that new car because I want it. So what I've learned is if I'm going to do something major, it's better to not do it in the heat of emotion, but to take a day or to go somewhere, take a few hours and just see if when everything settles, if you're still real peaceful. And if you have that peace, then go ahead and take another step. And if that works, then take another step. You know, sometimes we need to do things in steps to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And wisdom is so important. And you know, we could give a lot of definitions for wisdom, I guess, but I like to say that wisdom is common sense. You know, in other words, I'm not being led to go buy a new car if I'm already having trouble paying my rent. So right. we need to use wisdom and common sense. And, you know, a, a lot of the way that we learn to hear from God is by stepping out and sometimes making some mistakes. And God's always going to keep working with us and leading us and guiding us. And, and so we learn as time goes by. The wonderful thing also about the Holy Spirit is that it is supernatural. Right. He can and will tell us things we need to know that we right. didn't know without seeking him. And this is a question that I love because I think it just applies to so many lives. It's a good one to close with. Um, KH wants to know, when I'm brokenhearted, how does the Holy Spirit help me? It's such a great ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is helping us when we're hurting. Well, the Holy Spirit is, and this is one I forgot to talk about when, when I was talking about all the different facets of the Holy Spirit. He is first and foremost, the comforter the comforter. And so above all, he gives us comfort when we need comfort. You know, I see people go through some unbelievably difficult things. And it is just amazing to watch the Holy Spirit give them that supernatural comfort. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Uh, you know, I went through some very difficult things in my life. And, and you know, you just ask him to heal you, heal, heal me. I depend on you to comfort me in this situation. You know, I recall somebody saying something to me one day that really hurt me. And I've learned right away, instead of just getting mad at them or, you know, trying to make them pay me back for what they did, the best thing to do is to say, Holy Spirit, that hurt me so bad. Comfort me. Mm -hmm. Give me the comfort that only you can give me. I think, you know, a good way to end today would be to say that a lot of times, we spin our wheels trying to get from people what only God can give us. And many times we even get mad at them because they can't give it to us. And sometimes God won't let them 
because he wants us to go to him. And so if we go to the Holy Spirit first, he may comfort us through somebody else, but he may just do it supernaturally. And you know, it's very difficult sometimes, Ginger, to explain supernatural spiritual things. So I don't know that I can tell you how the Holy Spirit comforts us. I just know that he does if we go to him for that. And you know, a good thing to do is spend quiet time with God. You know, just if you're expecting him to comfort you, then just take a few minutes and just sit somewhere quietly, close your eyes, be alone, and just say, I believe that you're working in me right now, and I'm expecting comfort in my life from this difficult situation. Worship, play good worship music, that many times can really, God can work through that to bring you comfort. The the Holy Spirit is shown with love, um, caring, just by words, um, that shows the grace of God. I genuinely can understand how to react, what to say, and what to do or what not to do. So I try to be led by the Holy Spirit as much as possible. It's taught me to be more patient, have peace, have more peace. It empowers me (laughs) to do His will and counsels and helps and everything. I think that He's given me discernment. I think that he's given me guidance and developing in some areas of my life and he shows me. things that I need to improve. He gives you all the wisdom because he is wisdom. I don't think that the Holy Spirit gets the attention he deserves. <laughs> I just really don't. I feel like that uh, he's with us now and lives in us and has such a amazing every day, all the time ministry in our lives. And we very often just don't pay any attention to him at all. And I had been feeling really um, an urgency to do some teaching on the Holy Spirit. And so I asked around a little bit and found out that many people told me, well, we just don't hear about the Holy Spirit in our churches like we used to. Now, that doesn't mean that no church is talking about it all the time. But I just every place that I've taught, even in my own chapel at my office, and we've got seasoned Christians there. They were like, this is exactly what I needed to hear. It brings a greater awareness that God through the Holy Spirit is with you all the time and that he's not an it or an influence or a power, but a person, a divine person. We refer to him as the third person of the Trinity, but third not being lesser than, that's just the order in which they're talked about. In the very beginning of the Bible, God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make man in our image. And all throughout the Bible, you see that we serve one God manifested in three different persons or personalities. And one of my motives today is I want you to stop thinking that God will guide you and believe that he is guiding you. We've always got everything with God in the future. Well, someday and maybe, and but God is Faith is now. So right now, I believe that God is leading me and guiding me. And many ways when God is guiding us, initially we can think that we're not getting what we want. Or we can think that what's happening is a disappointment. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, Pastor Mike and His wife traveled with us. We're good friends. We've known them for a lot of years. And she's my administrative assistant. He's our staff pastor. And the time came a few years ago when they really wanted to sell their house. They really felt like they were supposed to sell their house. And they um, um, they put their house up for sale. They knew where they wanted to move. They were really looking forward to it. But the house never sold. Well, you know, no matter how much you want to move, if your house don't sell... 
you're kind of there. And so Penny and I were talking this morning and she said, it's a good thing that we, that God didn't give us what we wanted because that area of town where they wanted to move has since then had a lot of extreme violence in it. And so it ended up not being a good place for them to be. Let me tell you something. We live life forward, but we understand it backwards. And many times when we're not getting what we want, we don't understand, we're confused, we think God didn't hear us, or, or you know, we're not liking what's going on. But I believe that we cannot trust that God will guide us, but that he is guiding us, even because he is our guide. So therefore, if we ask him, guide us, and you have not because you ask not. So please ask, God, I ask you to guide me in everything that I do. What does Proverbs 3 say? Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. And so it's very simple every day to just say, God, this is my plan, but I know that my mind plans my way, but you direct my steps. And so if my plan's not working out, don't let me get all bent out of shape about it. Just know that you have a better plan than I have. Amen. Would it be insulting to you if I told you you're not smart enough to run your own life? Okay, you're not smart enough to run your own life. I'm so impressed with what the Apostle Paul said that's recorded in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. Of all the things that he knew, and he was given the task of writing about two-thirds of the New Testament by revelation, you would think that he already knew everything that he needed to know. And, and look at what he said. For my determined purpose, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. For my determined purpose is that I may know him. <laughs> what is your number one purpose in life? It really should be to know God. And I'm not talking about knowing about God. I'm talking about knowing God, and I'm not talking about sitting in church and hearing somebody else who knows God talk about God. You don't need secondhand faith. You need your own faith. You need your own relationship with God. Doesn't matter what grandma's got or what mama's got or what your pastor's got. You need to know him personally for yourself. But let me tell you something. When you come to know God, then you don't have to worry when you don't know what's going on. You can trust God. You can lean on him. You can rely on him. You are never alone. The father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He said he is going to be with you forever. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Where can I go from your spirit? There's nowhere that you can get away from God's spirit. Do you know some of you, because your grandma was praying for you and your mama was praying for you, even when you hung out in bars every night, the Holy Spirit trailed right along behind you, trying to bring a little conviction and a little help into your life. And you pray for your kids and you may have to watch them do dumb things for a few years, but let me tell you something. If you pray for them and you continue loving them, and you're a good example in front of them, don't try to tell your kids to do stuff you're not doing yourself. If you're a good example in front of them, the Holy Ghost is not going to leave them alone. He is going to pester them and pester them. There's always hope. We are never without hope when we have God. Okay, just a couple more scriptures. Psalm 91, 14, because he has set his love on me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name has a personal knowledge, not a knowledge through somebody else, but has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love, and kindness, trusts and relies on me, knowing I will never forsake him, no, never. Can somebody say, God will never forsake me. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We don't think they might. We know that they will. Why? Because we know our God. 
Job, in the worst conditions that you could possibly imagine, said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that I shall be redeemed on that final day. Do you know that having too much up here can actually prevent you from ever coming to know Christ and receive him? And I'm speaking to anybody who might be watching by TV today that, that you just think, well, this whole Jesus thing just makes no sense. It's just religion is just a crutch for people who can't manage their own lives. Well, you know, the truth is, is you might not be managing yours so well either. You may have business success. You might have money. You might be well known. But the point is, is do you have righteousness, peace, and joy? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know, are you confident about who you are? What if everything you owned was stripped away? Would you have any confidence then? Or is all your confidence coming from just what, what you have? Let me just tell you today that God loves you. And the very fact that you're listening to this right now is proof that God loves you. And he's trying to guide you out of the misery and the messes that you're in. He has a good plan for your life. It may not be what you're doing with your life right now. And that may be why you're not happy because you're not going according to God's plan. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to give you life eternal where you don't have to be afraid of death and you don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen after death. You can receive Christ as your savior today and your name can be written in the Lamb's book of life. All you need to do is pray a very simple prayer. God, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart and take my life and make me what you want me to be. Now, there's a phone number on your screen. And if you'll call that number, we'll have an operator standing by that can give you more information. We'll send you a booklet that we'd like you to have about how to start your new life right with Christ. But don't think that you're so smart that you don't need God. Because I'll tell you right now, some people are so smart that they don't ever... Christ because to them it makes no sense. Last night we talked about the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. And in Romans 8, 6, it says the mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. We don't need that. What we need is the Holy Spirit all mixed in with our plan. So if God wants something, it doesn't make any sense to me. He can give me discernment and revelation about it, and I can know that it's right even though my mind doesn't agree. What sense does it say if you give your money away, you'll have more than ever? I mean, really, lady? Do you think I'm a nutcase? I can count. <laughs> if I give my money away, how am I going to have more? Well, what sense does it make to say we have one God, three persons? Three never equals one, no matter what you do. How can the first be last and the last be first? If you're first, you're first. If you're last, you're last. What, what are you going to make out of that? <laughs> so there are things that we cannot make sense out of up here, but we know that we know that we know that we know. Let me tell you something. God is real and God is not dead. people out in the world, you are not going to get rid of God. I don't care how many signs you rip off the wall or how many things you tell us we can't do. You are not going to get rid of God. And you better hope 
that you give up on that idea before he comes back because I wouldn't want to be you and have to face him. Amen. And if somebody really doesn't want to serve God, that is your choice, but please leave us alone. Because I've made my choice. How about you? God is the only way to go. Come on, get up and give him a big praise. I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the first step to having a really great relationship with God is to know God, not just know about him, but to know his character and to, and to know him as the loving God who wants to do so many wonderful things for you. John 17, three says that eternal life is to know God. And when we do that, he just does so many wonderful things in our life that we just don't want to miss. You know, he is quite a gift to us and he sent us the gift of Christ and you know we're in the Christmas season and today we want to help you unwrap the true meaning of Christmas and we're offering you a book that we've put together here at the ministry called The Gift and it starts with the Christmas story but it also talks to us about all the different things that God has done for us through Christ and we're asking you today to give generously and receive this book as our gift to you and your gift today is going to help us with our television expenses around the world. Perhaps that you have watched the TV program all year and you've never once thought about sending in a gift to help cover the cost of it, and we need you to help us. So as you send your gift today, we're gonna send you this book called The Gift, and it's yours for any offering that you send today to help us with our television, and that's gonna help us continue then to send the gift of the word to other people around the world. I know that you're gonna do your best and we appreciate everything that you do. So God bless you and thank you ahead of time. Christmas is the time to give, to set aside our needs and focus on the needs of others. And we've made it easy to do just that. Through our Hand of Hope gift catalog, you can give to four specific outreach areas of need and help make a difference in someone's life this holiday season. You can help provide life's basic needs by giving towards our feeding and water outreaches, by rescuing women and children who are caught in human trafficking. Make a difference for those who are suffering by giving towards our medical and dental outreaches, or simply by giving to Hand of Hope and into other humanitarian outreaches where the needs are great. So this holiday season, give hope. When you give a special gift to one of the Hand of Hope outreaches, You'll receive Joyce's devotional, Trusting God Day by Day, as our gift to you. Call or visit us online and make a decision this Christmas to give hope. The proceeding was paid for.